Hi, everybody. Uh, we have an interruption to our regularly scheduled programming today. Uh, we have special guest joining us, Professor Max Weber, a guest whose uh, desire to speak with us I could not possibly turn down. So it's a slight adjustment of the syllabus, but so Professor Weber is going to lecture for about 45 minutes. Um, I'll let him introduce himself and tell you a little bit about what he's going to speak about. Then you'll be asking some questions, which is fantastic because those of you who completed the extra credit assignment have come to class prepared with some questions you'd like to ask Professor Weber. And then we'll spend about the last 10 minutes of class talking about the paper and the homework and other, other logistical mundane matters, okay? All right, Professor Weber. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Angelo. I appreciate it. It's uh, wonderful to be here on this occasion, most of all to be alive after all these years of being dead. <laughs> and even more fascinating, to be alive not as I was 100 years ago, but to be alive today in your world. This circumstance has allowed me the opportunity to revise and slightly bring up to date my lecture, Politics as a Vocation, on its 100th anniversary. I originally gave this lecture in the midst of the politically highly contentious period of the German Revolution that brought about the Weimar Republic. All of this in the wake of Germany's loss of what was then called the Great War, the war to end all wars, World War I. Much has changed, of course, but perhaps also much remains the same. To many people of your generation, ugh, ugh, is this technology? <laughs> ah, aha, voila. To many people of your generation, perhaps especially to various social movement activists, Politics seems a dirty business indeed today. I want to consider why and with what implications for the would-be politician. First, by exploring certain social conditions of politics, and then by examining the ethical choices that politicians face, and indeed that we all face, in relation to politics. This lecture, which I give to your professor's invitation, will necessarily disappoint you in a number of ways you will naturally expect me to take a position on actual problems of the day. But in today's lecture about policy and substantive content, questions of that sort must be eliminated, for such questions have nothing to do with the foundational question of what politics as a vocation means. I will explore that question in depth and at length. Please bear with me and listen carefully. There is no doubt in my mind, that you will disagree with much I have to say, and that you will want to hear much is that I do not say. And so I welcome your comments and questions on any topic you wish after I complete my lecture. Well, what do we understand by politics? This po concept is potentially extremely broad. This afternoon, we narrowly understand by politics the leadership or the influencing of the leadership of a state. But what then is a state? Sociologically, the modern state cannot be defined in terms of its ends. Ultimately, one can define the state only in terms of specific means peculiar to it. Today, we define a state as a political association that successfully claims a monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. Every state is founded on force, said the communist Leo Trotsky. That is indeed right. Of course, legitimate use of force is certainly not the only or the normal means of the state. Nobody says that. But within any given state, the state is considered the sole source of the right to use violence. The state is a relation of people dominating other people a relation ultimately supported by means of violence considered to be legitimate. In turn, politics involves striving to share power or striving to influence the distribution of power within a state. Then a question is said to be a political question, then a cabinet minister or an official is said to be a political official, or then a decision is said to be politically determined. That always means that interests in power are decisive. To begin, power is dependent on obedience, and obedience requires a justification, hence 
legitimation of domination. Today, we cannot deal with the various and highly complex bases of domination and authority. We are interested, above all, in one type, the charismatic authority possessed of the extraordinary and personal gift of grace, which produces among followers an absolutely personal devotion and personal confidence in revelation, heroism, or other qualities of an individual's leadership. That is charismatic domination. This charisma is the root idea of a vocation or a calling in its highest expression. In religion, we think of charisma as exercised by the prophet. In the field of politics, it is the province of the warlord, the great demagogue, or the political party leader. Devotion to the great demagogue in political office means that the leader is personally recognized as the inwardly called leader. And if he or she is anything more than a narrow and vain upstart of the moment, the leader lives for a cause. Charismatic politicians, those who are politicians by virtue of a calling, are, of course, nowhere as the only decisive figures in the political struggle for power. Yet in modern states, charismatic leaders have often had decisive effects on the course of politics. Consider your current president, Donald Trump, who deduces his legitimacy, no matter with what right, from the will of the governed. Whether you like him or not, you have to recognize him as a revolutionary and charismatic politician. Insofar as Trump and his political cronies have taken the place of the state bureaucratic authorities, for example, in the Environmental Protection Agency, the election of 2016 accomplished this much. The president has attained control over his party and the political staff and the apparatus of state resources, and he has usurped the power of Congress by declaring an unfounded fake national emergency. Today, we do not take a stand on this matter. I raise the example only to take a general point, namely that the modern state is a compulsory association that concentrates the social and material means of organization in the hands of its leaders. Over the course of modern political development, supplementing the charismatic leader, professional politicians have emerged. They are individuals who, unlike the charismatic leader, do not wish to be power holders themselves, but who enter the service of political power holders. Let us clarify the overall possibilities for people who are professional politicians. Politics, just like economics pursuits, may be a person's avocation or vocation. One may engage politics and not economically off politics, then only the independently wealthy can carry out politics. This does not mean that the leadership of the politically dominant strata will not also seek to live off politics, or that the dominant strata will not usually exploit their political domination in their own political interest. All this is economically understood. What is important is that the professional politician of independent financial means need not seek remuneration directly for political work, whereas every politician without such means must absolutely do so. However, we do not mean to say that the politician who lacks an independent source of wealth will use politics exclusively or even predominantly to pursue private economic advantage. Nor do we mean to say that he or she will not think, in the first place, of the substance of politics. Nothing could be more incorrect. According to all experience, the wealthy person has a concern for economic security that is a cardinal point of basic life, life orientation. By contrast, a quite reckless and unreserved political idealism is found, if not exclusively, at least predominantly, among people of social strata who, by virtue of their lack of independent wealth, stand entirely outside of the strata interested in maintaining the established economic order of a society. This holds especially for extraordinary and revolutionary epochs. Either politics can be conducted by independent 
that is wealthy individuals, and especially by those who live off rental or investment income, or political leadership is made accessible to individuals who are not independently wealthy and who must therefore be rewarded. Who are, what are the economic rewards? For the charismatic leader, like any politician, the key question of politics is always who benefits. Today, if you want to understand politics, you must recognize the centrality of spoils. That is, exploitation of people or expropriation of resources through the privilege of holding office. With the development of the money economy today, for loyal services, party leaders give out offices of all sorts. All party struggles are not only struggles for objective goals, they are also struggles for the patronage of office. Some parties in America once were pure patronage parties, handing out jobs and changing their material program according to the chances of grabbing votes. The development of modern officials into a highly qualified professional civil service specialized in expertise through long years of preparatory training stands opposed to all such arrangements. Modern bureaucracy has the interest of integrity and in so doing has developed a high sense of status honor. Without this sense of honor, the danger of an awful corruption represents a fatal threat. And without integrity, even the purely technical functions of the state apparatus become endangered. Today, your political system has its anomalies in the Electoral College, but it places the supposedly popular elected leader of the victorious party at the direct head of the apparatus of departments and appointed officials, that is, the administration. This political system separates public functionaries into two categories, not rigidly, but nevertheless distinctly separate. There are the administrative officials on the one hand and political officials on the other hand. The political officials can be recognized by the, by the fact that they can be dismissed at any time. The U.S. Cabinet Secretary of the Department of Defense, for example, is simply the representative of the political power constellation. He or she has to represent the power holder and oversee subordinate officials on a political basis. Thus, political officials only give out orders without themselves being technically capable of directing the state bureaucracy. We therefore need to ask for the typical character of the professional politician. In strictly vocational terms, the genuine civil servant operates as an official and will not engage in politics. Rather, he or she should engage in impartial administration. The civil servant shall administer his or her office without scorn and bias. Hence, not do precisely what the politician, the leader, as well as his or her following, must always unnecessarily do, namely, fight. To take a stand, to be passionate, and above all, uh, is the element of the political leader and the politician. Such an individual's conduct is subject to exactly the opposite principle of responsibility from that of the civil servant. The honor of the civil servant is vested in conscientiously executing the order of a superior authority exactly as if the order agreed with his or her personal conviction. This holds even if the order appears to be wrong. Thus, it is in the nature of the very best official to be a poor politician. By contrast, the political leader takes an exclusive personal responsibility for what he or she does, a responsibility that cannot and must not be rejected, ducked, or transferred. In modern societies, a relatively small number of people are interested primarily in becoming politicians and obtaining political power. Such politically inclined people intensively recruit followers, present themselves or their protégés as candidates for election, drum up financial support, and go out for vote grabbing. In practice, this means the division of those citizens with the rights to vote into politically active 
and politically passive elements. The active leadership and their freely recruited followers are the necessary elements in the life of any political party. The following, and through it the passive electorate, are necessary for the election of the leader. However, I hasten to add, political operatives may work to suppress the voluntary participation of their opponents, as we have seen in the past with poll taxes, and today in the U.S. with voter ID laws, voter rule purges, and the like, not to mention practices of gerrymandering and absentee vote harvesting for one's own candidate is that undermine competitive politics. All this to what end? In part, the answer is spoils. In the old days in the U.S., official appointments lay in the hands of the president, resulting in this exchange of 300,000 to 400,000 officials, even down to the mail carrier, based on the outcome of presidential elections. But that was before the patronage system was reduced through the introduction of the civil service system during the progressive era of the early 20th century. Today, with civil service reform, the number of presidential appointees is around 4,000, of which some 1,200 require Senate approval. Hence, the senators are powerful politicians. True, the United States today is largely rid of the old spoil system and its bribes and the political corruption that it bred in force. But it must be pointed out that a more modern form of political corruption has emerged in the form of corrupt political appointees who amount to nothing more than foxes guarding the henhouses in various U.S. institutions and regulatory environments. The Environmental Protection Agency, the Food and Drug Administration, the Department of the Interior, now to be headed by David Bernhardt, a former fossil fuels industry lobbyist, the Department of Education, and on and on. If the presidential appointees are not themselves caught up in conflicts of interest, and they often are, they are acting in the direct interests of so-called cronies in the economic sector, hence the modern term crony capitalism. You thus live politically today with a new and different spoils system based not in the old political machines but in the domination of corporate capitalists. Here, one long-lasting effect of the recent partial shutdown of the U.S. government for 35 days undoubtedly will be to discourage the well-trained college graduates that you all hope to become from seeking careers in the U.S. civil service. Today, one cannot see yet how politics as a vocation will shape itself in the future. Even less can one see what opportunities are opening up and to what political talents. The person who, by material circumstances, is compelled to live off politics will find many careers, the journalist, the blogger, employee of an NGO or social movement, or as a party official, representative and an interest group, such as a trade union, a political action committee, a chamber of commerce, a farm bureau, a labor board, an employer's association, and so forth. In figure one, we can see the many avenues by which members of Congress in this past election followed career routes into office. And I know this is a little bit small for you to read, so I enlarge it a bit. And you can see in the first half of it, uh, people who got to Congress going through private college, many of them, or public college, not very many people not going to college, many, many private or public going to law school, some people getting a master's degree, many, many people going into private law, and these are the beginnings of their careers, and then towards the end we see many of them going into business or management, uh, some of them starting their careers in local government, uh, some of them with no previous office experience, some of them using state legislature as a way of catapulting themselves into uh, office as a congressperson. Now then, what enjoyments can this sort of political career offer and what personal conditions are presupposed in order for someone to enter it? Well, first of all, the career of politics grants an inner feeling of power. 
influencing people, participating in power over them, and above all, feeling in one's hands a nerve fiber of connection to historically important events, these can elevate the professional politician above everyday routine, even in formally modest positions. But the question for such a person is, through what qualities can I hope to do justice to the responsibility that power imposes on the person who is allowed to put hands on the wheel of history? One can say that three preeminent qualities are decisive for the politician. Passion, a feeling of responsibility, and a sense of proportion. This means passion in the sense of matter-of-factness, of passionate devotion to a cause, to the god or demon who is its overlord. But mere passion, however genuine, is not enough to make a politician unless passionate devotion to a cause also takes responsibility to this cause as the guiding star of action. And for this, a sense of proportion is needed. The decisive psychological quality of the politician is thus the ability to take stock of political realities with inner concentration and calmness. Hence, the politician's distance from, toward things and people, lack of distance is one of the deadly sins for any politician. It is a quality that will condemn the afflicted to political incapacity. Here's the problem is this. How can warm passion and a cool sense of proportion be forged together in one and the same soul? True devotion to politics, if it is to be genuine rather than frivolous, can only come from passion. But the firm taming of the soul, which distinguishes the passionate politician from the mere political dilettante, is possible only through habitual detachment. Politics is made with the head, not with other parts as the body or soul. The strength of a political personality thus requires finding a way to combine passion, responsibility, and proportion. Therefore, the politician constantly has to overcome quite trivial and all too human enemies, a quite vulgar vanity, the deadly foe of both all devotion to a cause and of distance towards one's own ego. The politician must strive for power as an unavoidable means to reach political ends or goals. Thus, a sort of instinct for power is normal for the politician. Sins against the politician's vocational ethic only begin when this striving for power ceases to be objective and becomes purely personal self-intoxication instead of exclusively serving the cause. Ultimately, there are only two kinds of deadly sins in politics, lack of objectivity and, often but not always identical with it, irresponsibility. As we see all too easily in the personality of Donald J. Trump, vanity, the need personally to stand in the foreground as clearly and strongly as possible, tempts the politician to commit one or both of these sins. This is especially the case because the demagogue is compelled to count on effect. Such a person, therefore, is constantly in danger of becoming an actor. Such a person will also take lightly any responsibility for the outcomes of his interactions, being far more concerned merely with the impression he or she makes. Of course, your president, Donald Trump, is already an actor, albeit a bad one. His lack of objectivity tempts him to strive for the glamorous semblance of power rather than for actual power. And it has paid off for him among a sizable proportion of the American electorate an ardently promoted cult seeks to glorify him. His irresponsibility, however, is to be found in enjoyment of power merely for power's sake without any substantive commitment. Because power is the unavoidable means and striving for power is one of the driving forces of all politics, there is nothing more harmful 
as a distortion of political force than the parvenu-like braggart with power uh, and vain self-reflection in the feeling of power. The mere power politician may get strong effects, but actually that work leads nowhere and is senseless. In this, the critics of power politics are absolutely right. Fitnessing the sudden collapse, the inner collapse of people typical of this mentality, we can see what inner weakness and impotence hide behind the boastful but entirely empty gesture. They are products of a shoddy and superficially blasé attitude toward the meaning of human conduct. A politician of this ilk has no understanding of the nature of tragedy with which all action, but especially political action, is interwoven. Across history, there is a fundamental problem for all power politics. The final result of political action often, no even regularly, stands in completely inadequate and often paradoxical relation to its original meaningful intention. Because this is so, because the politician must serve a cause if action is to have inner strength. Exactly what the cause looks like is a matter of faith. The politician may serve national, humanitarian, social, ethical, cultural, worldly, or religious ends. The politician may be sustained by a strong belief in progress, no matter in what sense, or coolly reject this belief. The politician may claim to stand in the service of an idea, or rejecting this principle want to serve the end of improving people's everyday lives. However, some kind of faith must always exist. Otherwise, the curse of the politician creature's worthlessness overshadows even the externally strongest political successes. At this point, we arrive at the major problem that concerns us today, the ethos of politics as a cause. What vocation or calling can politics fulfill quite independently of its goals within the total ethical economy, that system of principles concerning moral conduct? Here, there is a clash of ultimate Weltanschauungen worldviews, among which, in the final analysis, one has to make a choice. Let us tackle this problem, which recently has become relevant again, with resolute determination. What relationship do ethics, a code of conduct, and politics actually have? Have the two nothing whatever to do with each other? Occasionally an exclusive choice has been proposed. Either one proposition or the other must be correct. But is there any ethical code that could establish identical commandments for erotic, business, familial, and official relations, for the relations to one's spouse, partner, or lover, to the food store clerk, one's child, the competitor, the friend, the defendant? Should it really matter so little for ethical demands that politics operates with very special means, namely power backed up by violence? Do we not see that the Bolshevik communists, ideologists of the Soviet Revolution, brought about exactly the same results as any militaristic dictator precisely because they depended on violence as a political means? In what but the persons of the elite power holders and the dilettantism of the old regime of Tsarist Russia did the Workers' and Soldiers' Council differ? Today, in what way does the style of polemics of many representatives of presumably new ethic on the left differ from that of the opponents that they criticize or from the ethic of any other demagogues? In their noble intention, people will say, good. But it is the means about which we speak here, and adversaries on all sides, in complete subjective sincerity, claim in the very same way that their ultimate intentions are of lofty character. By the sword you did your work, and by the sword you will die, said the ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus. Fighting is everywhere fighting. Hence, the ethic of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' sermon, which is the absolute ultimate ethic of the ends of the Christian gospel, is a more serious matter than those fond of quoting the Bible today believe. 
The demands of Jesus' sermon implied a natural law of absolute imperatives based on religion. For this Christian ethic is the same holds as holds for causality in science. It is not an Uber ride which one can get out of at one's pleasure. It is all or nothing. Take the teaching, turn the other cheek. This command is unconditional and does not consider the source of the other's authority uh, to hit a person. For anyone but a saint, it is an ethic of indignity. At least here, as you say, the deal is this. One must be saintly in everything, at least in intention, one must live like Jesus, the apostles, St. Francis, the Buddha, or their like. Then this ethic makes sense and expresses a kind of dignity. Otherwise, it does not. For if it is said, in line with the ethic of absolute love, resist not whoever is evil with force, it's quite different for the politician. The reverse proposition holds, thou shalt resist evil by force, or else you are responsible for evil winning out. Whoever wishes to follow the ethic of the gospel should abstain from violent demonstrations or strikes, for strikes mean compulsion. Above all things, those following the gospel should not talk of revolution. After all, the ethic of the gospel does not teach that the war involved in a revolution is legitimate where other wars are not. Any true pacifist who follows the gospel will refuse to bear arms. As with the Quakers during your war of independence, as in Germany in World War I, so in America with pacifists refusing particip to participate in World War II and the Vietnam War, this was the recommended ethical duty to end all wars. Let us then consider the problem of conflicting ethics in politics. All ethically oriented conduct may be guided by one of two ethics in politics. And they are differing and irreconcilably opposed maxims. Conduct can be oriented to an ethic of absolute ends or to an ethic of responsibility. This is not to say that an ethic of ultimate ends is identical with irresponsibility or is that an ethic of responsibility is identical with unprincipled opportunism. Nobody says that. However, there is an unbridgeable difference between these two ethics. On the one hand, in an ethic of ultimate ends, in the terms of one world religion, the Christian acts with righteousness and leaves the results with God. On the other hand, with conduct that follows an ethic of responsibility, one has to give an account of the foreseeable results of one's action. Consider a convinced and uncompromising supporter of Bernie Sanders in the 2016 election, someone who believes in an ethic of ultimate ends. You might have shown such a person that failing to support Hillary Clinton in the general election of 2016 would result in increasing the forces of reaction, thus increasing the oppression of his or her class, ethnicity, or gender persuasion, and obstructing its cause. But you would not have made the slightest impression on the Bernieite. The true believer in an ethic of ultimate ends feels responsible only for seeing to it that the flame of pure intentions is not snuffed out. For example, the flame of protesting against the injustice of the social order. To rekindle the flame ever anew is the purpose of deeds that are quite irrational, if judged in view of their possible success. They are acts that can and shall have only exemplary value. If an action of good intent leads to bad results, then in the eyes of someone pursuing an ethic of ultimate ends, not he or she, but the world, or the stupidity of other people, or God, God's will is responsible for the evil. However, a person who believes in an ethic of responsibility takes account precisely of the average deficiencies of people. The responsible individual does not have the right to presuppose people's goodness 
and perfection. People operating under the ethic of responsibility do not feel in a position to burden others with the results of their own actions so far as they are able to foresee them. They will say, these results are charged as the consequences of my action. Thus, no ethics in the world can dodge a serious issue. In numerous instances, to attain good ends, one must be willing to pay the price of using morally dubious or even dangerous means. And one must also face the possibility of evil ramifications. No ethics in the world can determine when the ethically good purpose justifies ethically dangerous means and evil consequences. The decisive means for politics, I repeat, is violence. As the French social theorist Georges Sorel told us back when I was alive, violence is a central tool of political conflict and protest. The modern state has the use of force as a backstop. For their part, politicians must be willing to fight if they are not to be mowed down by their opponents. But when is violence justified? You may see the ethical tension between means and ends by considering various uncompromising revolutionaries who assert a striking principle. But if we face the choice, either more violence, years of war, perhaps widespread social suffering, and then revolution versus peace and less suffering, now, and no revolution. Revolutionaries will say, without hesitation, we choose more years of war or suffering to bring about the revolution. Then there is the further question, what can this revolution bring about? In the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, after the transition of China from a communist people's republic, to a state-centered command capitalist economy, every theoretically sophisticated revolutionary in the 21st century would have to acknowledge a simple point. One cannot speak of a transition to an economy that would be completely socialist. A bourgeois economy of one kind or another will reemerge. For this very modest result, they are willing to face more years of war or suffering however justified revolutionaries' rejection of the aims of the power politicians as the old order may be, it is utterly ridiculous for revolutionaries to morally denounce those power politicians for using the same means that the revolutionaries themselves use. The ethic of ultimate ends ultimately must go to pieces on the problem of justifying the means on the basis of the ends. The adherent of an ethic of ultimate ends can all too easily suddenly morph into an apocalyptic messiah, envisioning the end of the old order. Those, for example, who have just preached love over violence may call for the use of force for the last violent deed, which would then lead to a state of affairs in which violence is annihilated. The proponent of, a, proponent of an ethic of absolute ends cannot stand up under the ethical irrationality of the world. If one makes any concessions at all to the principle that the ends justifies the means, it is not possible to decree ethically which end should justify which means. Thus, in theoretical terms, the ethic of ultimate ends has only the possibility of rejecting all action that employs morally dangerous means. But the problem is more complicated than those advocating an ethic of ultimate ends would have it. The early Christians knew full well that the world is governed by demons and that whoever opts for politics, that is for power and forces a means, makes a deal with diabolical powers. For such a political individual, it is not true that good can only follow from good and evil only from evil, but that often the opposite is true. Anyone who fails to see this 
is a political infant. We all find our ways among diverse walks of life, each of them governed by different laws. Religious ethics have dealt with this fact in different ways. For example, take Catholic Christianity, which affirms a special ethic for those endowed with the charisma of a holy life. There stands the monk who must not shed blood or strive for gain. Yet beside that monk, there stands the pious soldier and the capitalist who are allowed to do exactly what the monk cannot. The one to shed blood, the other to pursue money. In some theologies of Christian faith, for example, in the Crusades of the medieval era, the wickedness of the world stemming from original sin allowed the integration of violence into ethics as a disciplinary means against sin and against the heretics who endanger the soul. But it is not just Catholic Christianity. Protestant Christianity absolutely legitimated the state as a divine institution and hence violence as a means. Protestantism especially legitimated the authoritarian state. Martin Luther, who initiated the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s, relieved the individual of the ethical responsibility for war and transferred it to the authorities. To obey the authorities in matters other than those of faith could never constitute guilt. Calvinism, in turn, engaged in principled violence as a means of defending the faith. Thus, Calvinism, Calvinism like Catholicism, knew the crusade for which Islam was an element of life from the beginning. It is a specific means of legitimate violence that determines the peculiarity of all problems in politics. Whosoever contracts with violent means for whatever ends, and every politician ultimately must be prepared to do so, is exposed to its consequences. This holds especially for the crusader, religious, and revolutionary alike. Particularly important for such crusaders is the relationship to followers. Any leader who wants to establish absolute justice on earth by force requires a following. Such a leader must hold out to followers the necessary internal and external rewards, heavenly or worldly, or else followers will not participate. For example, under the conditions of your modern culture of wars, fought roughly along lines of socioeconomic class, region, and urban, suburban, rural residents, the internal rewards consist of satisfying various deeply held emotions, hatred, cravings for revenge, and above all, resentment, and the need for pseudo-ethical self-righteousness. The opponents must be slandered and accused of heresy. The external rewards are adventure, victory, booty, power, and spoils. The success of the leader completely depends on the participation of followers. Therefore, the leader depends upon whether or not the rewards can be delivered to the followers, for example, to the Tea Party, the dirty tricksters, the agitators. What someone like Donald Trump actually attains under the conditions of his presidency is therefore not within his own control, but is prescribed to him by the motives of his base. Motives that, if viewed ethically, are predominantly contemptible. The base can be harnessed only so long as an honest belief in Trump's person and his cause inspires at least part of the following. Although not necessarily the majority. This belief, even when subjectively sincere, is often really no more than an ethical legitimation of cravings for revenge, power, booty, and spoils. We should not be deceived about this matter by verbiage. The materialist interpretation of history is no Uber ride to be exited at will. Material interests do not stop short if and when the promoters of revolutions or other radical political transformations succeed. And here I include the election of Donald Trump as one such radical political transformation. The emotional highs of revolution eventually are followed by return to the routines of everyday life, the crusading leader in the faith 
itself fade away, or in a more effective routinization of charisma, the faith becomes part of the conventional narrative of political Philistines and geekish nerds who work for political work as political polit uh, technicians. Whoever wants to engage in politics at all, and especially in politics as a vocation, has to face up to these ethical paradoxes. The politician must take responsibility for what may come under the impact of how these paradoxes are addressed. I repeat, the politician must face up to the diabolical forces lurking in all violence. The great virtuosi of a cosmic love of humanity and goodness, whether Jesus of Nazareth or Francis of Assisi or the Buddha, have not operated with the political means of violence. Their kingdom is not of this world. And yet they have worked and still work in this world. The figures of the saints in Dostoevsky's book, War and Peace, still remain their most adequate reconstructions. Let us be clear. Whoever seeks salvation of the soul, of one's own and of others, should not seek it along the avenue of politics, for the quite different tasks of politics can only be solved by violence. The genius or demon of politics lives in an inner tension with the God of love, with the Christian God as expressed by the church. This tension can at any time lead to an irreconcilable conflict. If one says world peace instead of fatherland or nation, which at present may seem a dubious value to some, then you face the problem as it stands now. Everything that is pursued through political action operating with violent means and following an ethic of responsibility endangers the salvation of the soul. If, however, one chases after the ultimate good in a war of beliefs, following a pure ethic of absolute ends, then the goals may be damaged and discredited for generations, because responsibility for consequences is lacking. And the diabolical forces that enter the play remain unknown to the actor. These diabolic forces are relentless, and they produce unintended consequences even in the pursuit of good. We all thus need to become more mature. The sentence, the devil is old, grow old to understand him, does not refer to age in terms of chronological years. The mere fact that someone like you is 20 years of age while I am over 50 is no cause for me to think that mine is an achievement before which I should be regarded with awe. Age is not decisive. What is decisive is the trained relentlessness in viewing the realities of life and the ability to face such realities maturely and to measure up to them inwardly. Surely, facing reality is a matter of the head. And as I said earlier, er, politics is made with the head. But politics is certainly not made with the head alone. In this, those who advocate an ethic of ultimate ends are right. One cannot prescribe to anyone whether to follow an ethic of absolute ends or an ethic of responsibility or when one and when the other. One can say only this much. If in these times, if now suddenly the ideological pundits, spin doctors, and politicians advancing totalistic worldviews crop up en masse and pass the watchword, the world is stupid and banal, not I, and goes on to say, the responsibility for the consequences does not fall upon me, but upon the others whom I serve and whose stupidity or banality I shall eradicate. Then these pundits, spin doctors, and politicians are almost always engaged in complete blather, intoxicating themselves with romantic ideas, but not fully realizing what they take on upon themselves. This is not profoundly moving. But it is immensely moving when a mature person, no matter whether old or young in years, is aware of a responsibility for the consequence of his, of his or her conduct and really feels such a responsibility with heart and soul. Such a person then acts by following an ethic of responsibility and still somewhere reaches the point where it is said, 
Here I stand. I can do no other. Every one of us who is not spiritually dead must realize the possibility of finding oneself at some time in exactly that position. Insofar as this is true, an ethic of ultimate ends and an ethic of responsibility are not absolute contrasts, but rather supplements that only in unison constitute a genuine person, a person who can have the calling for politics. Now then, ladies and gentlemen, let us debate this matter once more ten years from now. Unfortunately, for a whole series of reasons, I fear that the waves of reactionary politics will still be breaking over us in 2029. Even as we face ever more intense world historical challenges, most decisively in the long run climate change, it is very probable that little of what you, and I candidly confess, I too wish and hope for, will be fulfilled. Little, perhaps not exactly nothing, but what to us at least seems little. This will not crush me, nor should it crush you who are young. But surely there is an inner burden to realizing our collective situation. I wish I could see ten years from now what will become of those of you who now feel inspiration to be genuinely principled politicians and who share in the intoxication signified by one revolutionary cause or another. It would be nice if the springtime of your lives led to summer's flowers blooming. But it is not summer's bloom that lies ahead of us, but rather a polar night of icy darkness and hardness, no matter which side may triumph politically now. When this night shall have slowly receded, who of those for whom spring might have seemed to produce such magnificent blooms will still be alive? And what will become of all of you by then? Will you be bitter or robotic? Will you simply and dully, dully accept the world and occupation? Or will another and by no means the least frequent possibility be your lot? mystic or drug-induced flight from reality. Those yogis, monks, and stoners who follow this path and follow it too far, I shall conclude, have not measured up to the world as it really is in its daily routine. Objectively and actually, they have not experienced the vocation for politics in its deepest meaning, which they thought they had. They would have done better simply to cultivate plain friendship in personal relations, and for the rest, they should have gone soberly about their daily work. Politics is a strong and slow boring of hard boards. It takes both passion and perspective. Certainly, all historical experience confirms the truth that humanity would not have attained the possible unless time and again we had reached for the impossible. But to do that, a person must be a leader, and not only a leader, but a hero as well, in a very sober sense of the word. And even those who are neither leaders nor heroes must arm themselves with that steadfastness of heart that can brave even the crumbling of all hopes. This is necessary right now, or else people will not be able to attain even that which is still possible today. Only someone who is sure that he or she shall not crumble when the world from his or her point of view is too stupid or too base for what he or she wants to offer. Only that person has the calling for politics. Only the individual who in the face of all this can say, in spite of all, has the calling for politics. Thank you so much for your attention, and now I am open to your com comments and questions about any and all topics, my work in sociology, this lecture, or the current political scene, which I shall try to discuss with you to the very best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Weber. Um, I realized we didn't have any water for you up here. I oh, apologize. It's all right. It's all right. 
So, um, so for those of you who came in a little late, just to recap what's going on here, we had our special guest today, Professor Max Weber, who's delivering us, uh, has delivered for us an updated version of his famous speech, Politics as a Vocation. So it's the 100th anniversary of the speech, as Mr. Uh, Professor Weber said, and so he's provided some updates given the current political situation. So we're gonna take some comments and questions for the professor now. Um, because we are recording this special event, you are going to ask those questions into a microphone. So I will run around the room with the mic um, and take them for you. And you can ask questions, as he indicated, both about this speech, right, in its original or its revised version, as well as his work in general, the other uh, well, pieces. Well, the original was much longer. It was two hours, so <laughs> you got off lucky. Yeah, so we were discussing before this event how unused most of us are today to sitting through a full lecture. So this was only half of one, really. One third, I, I think. One actually, third. Yeah. yeah, okay. Does anyone want to be brave and start off with a question? Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, first of all. Very welcome. Um, you mentioned that revolution cannot really be sustained because um, of the routinization of a charismatic leader. Um, I was wondering if, you, if that's true, then can revolution ever be realized? Is that something that is never attainable and should we just continue to operate within the realm of politics and try and keep a steadfast heart? Um, well, I, I, that's a great question and I think there are two kinds of answers. There's a, a sociological answer and a personal answer. Uh, and the personal answer has to do with politics as a vocation. The sociological answer has to do with what are the possibilities of success for a revolution. Historically, we look across revolutions and we see that they are transformative at one level. Uh, there's a sociologist at Harvard today. Uh, I, I, I uh, came to know her work after I was born again. Uh, Theta Scotchpole, uh, who has his book States and Social Revolutions, which uh, I would urge you to con consult. She looks at the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, and so forth. And indeed, they are transformative, and yet, if one looks 10, 20, 30 years hence, not so much is accomplished. The French Revolution, the first major transformative revolution, truly transformative revolution, not counting the American Revolution, of course. It was turned about after 15 years, and the force of reaction uh, took hold. Uh, in many cases, in the Soviet Union, for example, the revolution transformed the social order, gave very different people power, but the apparatus of power was not so different from czarism. And so these are the challenges, the sociological challenges of revolution. On the other hand, in the matter of a political vocation, one has to have, as I said in my lecture, one has to have ideals. One has to have some utopian vision. One has to have a cause. And fighting for that cause is necessary. And Oftentimes, against an established order, fighting for that cause will be revolutionary. And yet, one has to be, in my estimation, responsible about how one fights for that cause so as not to precipitate even greater reaction. I know people who came of age during the Vietnam War in the counterculture. I've been introduced to them since I've been back. And they, they fought they, to create a utopian society. Some of them dropped out, turned on, tuned out, dropped out, and went and formed communes, utopian communes out in the woods in the Santa Cruz Mountains. They're still there. Um, and yet they underestimated the reaction against them that brought Ronald Reagan neoliberalism, and the world which we have today. So uh, what that they could have seen, and they did not actually achieve a revolution, but they had unintended consequences for what they fought for. So trying to gauge the consequences and the trade-offs of what one does as a political actor 
I think that is the key to politics of vocation. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Okay. Anybody next? Yeah. Hello. Um, Hello. Do you think our current partisan politics are something more indicative of a larger social phenomenon, or do you think it's a symptom of our political system? Well, that is a very interesting question. Uh, is it just the political system or is it something else? And I think it's a little bit of both in that your political system has uh, a party system in which there are elections and in which the president runs in a way independently of his party or her party and can win without having power. If you look at France or the United Kingdom or my country of Germany, they have a parliamentary system. The parliamentary party that is in power chooses the prime minister. And that's a very different situation. It has a different dynamic to it. So we're interested in the dynamics of political party structures there. And it's certainly the case that in the United States, there have been long periods of more or less politics as usual. The parties are competing for the center, competing for those votes. And then every once in a while, 1896 was an interesting example, suddenly the parties become drastically polarized and they are competing for voters over here and over there. And that seems to be happening today, that there is a polarization in the electorate that is not simply a feature of the political party structure, but is a product of the politics on the ground, if you will. Uh, and we could spend a long time talking about what those processes are. Uh, in part, we can lay it at a kind of neoliberalism that was a consensus of the moderate Republican Party and the moderate Democratic Party that left out large numbers of people who did not identify with the agenda and were basically underserved in terms of the delivery of the rewards of politics by either party. And that was in the 2016 election exploited quite masterfully by Donald Trump uh, and not at all by Hillary Clinton. We don't know what would have happened if uh, Bernie Sanders had been the nominee. He also was interested in that underserved constituency. So we don't know. But what we do know is that your country today faces a situation of deep political alienation of people from one another, that this is fed in part by agents of foreign powers, Russia, and that it is a Humpty Dumpty problem. You can't really just magically put the egg back together once it falls off the wall. So uh, you are faced with this crisis, and believe me, no matter what happens in the foreseeable future, Robert Mueller, uh, good German name, um, his report, uh, impeachment, whatever happens, this alienation, this cutthroat fighting in politics is not going to go away in the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, Professor Weber, while I get to the next question, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the audience for your speech initially or the political situation that you were responding ah, to. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, Back in uh, 1919, 100 years ago, in a few days, I gave this lecture uh, to a, a German student union at the University of Munich. Uh, and um, I did it right after World War I, which I, it's hard for me to say that without breaking into laughter, because I know that's not the way you talk in English. Uh, but, uh, and th there was a profound disappointment of German people after World War I. Uh, and there were, on the one hand,
people who were revolutionaries, who were socialists, who saw what was going on in Russia, and who wanted to bring about the revolution in Germany. And then there were guardians of the old order who wanted to preserve Bismarck's regime. And then there were the new social democrats who wanted to achieve power. And it was in this very contentious political moment, in a way, contentious exactly, not exactly, but in a way, like the political contentions of your moment today in uh, American politics, is that I gave the speech. And of course, the history is a sad history. Uh, I know now that um, the Weimar Republic failed, and in a way, one could argue that it failed precisely in a similar way that neoliberalism of both the Clintons and the Bushes and Obama failed. They failed in dealing with the heartfelt existential problems of working people. And the working people then became the basis of the Nazi movement and the demagogue Hitler and the vast sad consequences of genocide and war. So it was a pivotal moment. We can't see the future, but uh, it I, I, I'm, I'm disturbed, frankly, when I read back at my lecture uh, from 100 years ago and what turned out after that lecture, and then when I look at your world. Yeah. Willie. Hi, Professor. Um, I'm thinking of your wonderful book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Well, thank you very much incredible piece of literature. And I'm wondering, in that book, you say that this ethic um, weighs down upon us like an iron cage. And I'm wondering what you would say to people who, especially in this moment of neoliberal capitalism, um, are cynical about politics, or perhaps cannot even engage with politics because they are weighed down by increasingly precarious work um, and the kind of work that we have to do? Uh, that is a magnificent question. And like all the questions that we've had here, it is a big question. I like big questions. Um, is that translation was a bad one. Um, is the iron cage? I did not use the iron cage. That was not the metaphor. Also, you know, OK, well, all right. But it was a kind of a clockwork mechanism that we cannot get off of. And in a way, that clockwork mechanism is as much today a part of our lives as it was then. And even more with the internet, with texting, with calendars that you share with other people. The expectations and the integration of life is very different from a clock anymore, where I should say the clock has changed. Uh, but the major point of the Protestant ethic book, or at least one of them, if we accept the thesis about the significance of the Protestant ethic, is that yes, it was important in creating the conditions for uh, capitalism and world empire. Uh, but once people became habituated and trained to work under the clock so that they didn't need their inner clock anymore, or so that their inner clock, its mechanism came from someplace else than religion, the Protestant ethic as a religious ethic could fade away. So that's the first point. But the second point, and I think the, the more important point, in a way, uh, in terms of politics and a vocation of politics, is the question, and it goes back to what I said of living uh, for politics or off of politics. And precisely today, many people are working two jobs. They're homeless. They don't have enough money for a house to live in, even if they're working jobs. And so, how is that person to engage in politics? That is a very deep and troubling question. I would say that we make our choices. And that each of us 
can probably participate more in politics than we do, and that when we do, we have to recognize that the powers that control the levers of our society or your society are incredibly committed to its perpetuation in its present form. If you simply want to create a more equitable distribution of income in your country, say you want an equitable distribution that's not radically different from what it was in 1925, just after I died, before it started becoming more and more and more unequal. That's not radical, but you can bet that the powers that be, the big financial interests, will fight it tooth and nail. And if you are interested in changing that or any other thing, you have to be ready to fight. And I, I feel the pain of people who don't have the money, who don't have the resources, uh, and only, but I do see a lot of people who are pretty close to down and out participating in politics. It's quite amazing. It can be done. So it depends on whether you have the fire in your belly. And I think either you have the fire in your belly or you live with the consequences if you don't vote. I, I, I talked to a, 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 a young man. He was doing political work in Kentucky uh, last election. And he said he was talking, he was going around canvassing voters, trying to grab votes, as I said in my um, lecture. And he talked to one person, and the person says, if you don't vote, you don't get to gripe. And I think that's the lesson here. Yeah, you can go out and do whatever you want and not be involved in politics, but if you do, keep your mouth shut. Okay. Anybody on this side of the room? Yeah. I lost the hand. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. So I had a question. Um, I just thought um, your explanation of the two ethics of ultimate ends versus the ethic of responsibility. Right. And relating it to his question, um, I'm just interested in like how you think uh, the sense of like social responsibility related to like, you know, the ethic in, in like, you know, ethic of responsibility in more of a social widespread sense, like how, how has that changed um, since uh, like, you know, when you were first starting to write the Protestant ethic and Bill. how has that changed in sense, you know, over time in our life and your lifetime, do you think? It's, uh, it's a very interesting question because uh, both 100 years ago, well, I published the Protestant ethic in 1904, 1905, after I got over my mental illness that was caused by my relationship with my father. Um, but that's all water over the dam, as they say. Um, when I wrote that book, I was writing it about people in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries who were living in a world that was not yet routinized and rationalized as an industrial and now post-industrial social order. And so the ethic of the two ethics in those days would be quite different from one another in terms of the powers that they confronted. Uh, to take an ethic of ultimate ends was to be, in effect, a martyr. And that's not to say that there aren't martyrs today. You look at Martin Luther King as such uh, a martyr uh, committed to an ethic of ultimate ends, but at the same time, in relation to my lecture, also someone who had a sense of responsibility and a sense of pragmatic politics. The question of the ethic of ultimate ends is, uh, is a question of what your ends are and how you justify them. And I think that if you see them as ultimate ends, then 
you need to wrestle with them uh, in the way that the Buddha or Jesus or so forth did. If you think, as I happen to think, that climate change is the looming mega disaster for this planet in this era, you have to figure out how you can maximally try to achieve changes that will prevent the suffering of what we know already will be millions of people. Okay? And we all have a responsibility for that. At the same time, we have a responsibility to our friends, to our lovers, to our families, to our neighbors. And balancing all of that is a very difficult task, and it's a task of the ethic of responsibility. And so I can't tell you, you know, how to live your life, how to make these choices. All I can ask you to do is to face up to them as best you can, to identify what your goals are, what your ends are, who your friends and neighbors and relations and what your relation to global humanity is, and make your decisions on that basis. Great. And um, since we're nearing the end of our time together, maybe we'll collect a couple of questions at once and let you address them simultaneously. Um, so if violence, as you've said, is a primary factor of politics, do you see violence as a necessary tool for successful resistance? And to dovetail, kind of what tools of resistance do we have against a bureaucratic system of control? Oh. <laughs> and before, while you contemplate that one, any other sort of burning questions that we should get on the table before we? Yeah. OK. Thanks. This is My question is, what can general citizens do to demand for Stehen or empathetic understanding from the institutions and politics that we live in today in America? For Stehen, we talked about your word. What can word. we do to demand it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. okay. Um, these are both very difficult questions. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question of Verstehen, um, or understanding, uh, we need to try to understand ourselves. That's the first task for us. What we can do to encourage politicians and civil servants and the state bureaucracy to understand is a much more difficult question. But I think that the problem is simply this. And I. I I skipped over part of my lecture in saying this. Uh, I didn't say this in my lecture, but I, you give me an opportunity to say it now. In politics, the person who is elected almost inevitably doesn't kiss goodbye the base, the followers, but operates in a world in which the responsibilities are quite different. And often, too often, becomes detached from that empathy, that understanding of people's situations. The only thing I can say is that the more you bring people to accounting, politicians to accounting, through letters, through going to meetings where they hear your voice, through your vote, through those things where you insist we will be heard, um, that's what you can do. And in an odd way, I don't know how many of you voted for Trump, but in an odd way, the people, many of the people who voted for Trump didn't know what he was about, didn't know him as a person, maybe got attracted by his charisma, but what they saw was this. Here's a guy, here's a guy who allows me to give the finger to the establishment. Here's a guy, I can cast my vote and say, you're not listening to me. And the moderate Republican Party, the establishment Democratic Party, are still not quite woke on that. <laughs> so now, as to the question of violence, I, I wish I had an answer. The state dominates and in the last resort uses violence. It arrests people who are illegal aliens and puts them into a system where you or I can't reach those people. 
We can't talk to them. We can't do anything with them. They are absorbed by a state apparatus. That is violence. Be clear about it. The state is routinely, and that's just one example, the violence against the environment, the violence against women, the violence against people of color. It's all violence. Don't kid yourself. And then the question is, well, what do we do in response? What do people do in response? And I think there is a way in which one can exercise a violence that is nonviolent. That is one lesson of Gandhi. It is one lesson of Martin Luther King. Uh, it is a lesson that blocking a train that is taking war munitions to a ship that will use it to bomb people in Vietnam, that is an act of violence. You're not hurting anybody, but you are standing in the way in a way that is violent. And so one needs to think very carefully about the means of violence. And simply saying, as I tried to argue in my lecture, trying to say, well, the ends justifies the means, is not, to me, an adequate answer. You look at, go watch the movie, The War at Home. I seriously, I recommend it to you. I, I watched it uh, after I was uh, resurrected, reborn, whatever you want to call it. It feels so good. Um, I mean, really, you know, I died like a year and a half after I gave that lecture, and now I'm back. You know, I mean, such a deal. But anyway, I digress. Uh, you, you, uh, you cannot say, well, the end is good, and therefore any means to attain it is OK. But you can say, it seems to me, if you're responsible, I have my ultimate ends. And I'm not speaking here as a sociologist. I'm speaking to you as a person. I have my ultimate ends, my goals I want to reach. I am responsible in that I am thinking about the consequences of my action, and I am willing to take this kind of action or that kind of action in a way that takes account of the possible consequences. And the trouble, the, the challenge that you all face today is, is that the machine, if you will, is already geared up to discredit you virtually no matter what you do. And so I don't know your politics. I don't know your strategies, I don't know your issues, but I do know that it is, as I said, the long, slow drilling of hard boards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Andrew. Thank you.